Marlita, welcome. It's so wonderful to have you a part of the Learn to Listen series. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited because I know some of our audience is familiar with you and others. I'm just so happy to introduce you to them and just would love <laughs> for you to just lead right in and just start sharing about uh, you, your life, your story, to some of these passions, and we'll pop into some of these questions. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Marlita Hill. I am a choreographer, author, uh, mentor. Um, right now, I am getting my MFA at Bellhaven University in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I am also the founder of the Kingdom Artist Initiative, where we mentor artists of faith who are building careers in secular culture. So I have written books. I have a podcast. Um, just launching a course or a Bible study for artists and artist communities. Um, so yeah, that is in a nutshell about me. Not so great. <laughs> Maybe go ahead and share some about um, just your investment as a dancer and some of how you began. Um, I think that would be really interesting and, in, you know, being in the marketplace as an educator and you know, being a believer artist, I'd love to hear mm -hmm. some of that early um, foundation because I know it has Absolutely. shifted a little bit in the mm -hmm. directives. So uh, we'd love to hear that. Absolutely. So it's interesting that you asked me that because the other day I was talking to a young lady from Inner Varsity and she asked me about my journey and trajectory and what I think is important. And I told her, and this is something that I that guides my work in the Kingdom Artist Initiative with artists who are feeling like their faith is separate from their art. I've never known God separate from my art. He was the one who catalyzed this entire creative journey for me. Um, I was not interested in dance, wasn't even thinking about it. I wanted to be a psychologist. But when I was 15, um, I went to a church and there's this program called BOSS, Building on Spiritual Substance. And they teach youth entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship <laughs> based off of biblical principles. They have this uh, resort up in the Idlewild Mountains called Al Hadis. And so every holiday and different uh, times, they would have these kind of events and those kind of carnivals, those kinds of things. And I would go with my trainers up there. So there was this one particular day, I was 15, I was volunteering, and this dance ministry was introduced. Now, my grandmother and my aunts used to take us to cultural events all the time, to the theater, to plays, to shows. So I knew what the arts were. And they were cool, but it wasn't something I was interested in, right? Um, and so I was at the carnival and I heard this voice say, go watch. And that is the first time I ever remember hearing God speak to me. And it said, go watch. And I was like, I'm not interested in watching. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. It was a who or what, but it said it again, and then it said it again, and finally I was like, this thing is not going to leave me alone. So I went and I sat down and I watched, very arrogantly, I might add. And so they started ministering. Uh, the, the company was the Hush Company, um, and it was directed at the time by Stacy and LaQuinn Meadows in Los Angeles. And when they started dancing, it felt like an elephant sat on my chest, like I couldn't move. Tears were pouring down my eyes. And it was interesting because one of the boss mentors, she saw God dealing with me. And so after they finished ministering, she asked me if I wanted to meet them. Uh, so she took me upstairs. I prayed with them. And then I was at rehearsal on Tuesday. <laughs> and thus began, that began my life in dance. And so I ministered with the Hush Company for eight years. Um, that's where I learned about uh, alongside purpose and vision and ministry, I also learned that, that I had a gift for this and particularly for teaching and choreographing. And so I, you know, like I said, I was with them for eight years. Then the Lord, you know, led me out of there after eight years, which was very difficult for me to leave them. Cause you know, when I was in the thick of it, I was like, wherever y'all go, give me a room. Cause I'm going with you. Like that. <laughs> that's how, that's how. So it was very difficult for me to leave them. We're still in relationship today, which is amazing. 
Um, so then he led me to um, ministering on my own. Um, and then he told me, you know, go to school for this. And I was like, okay. So I did not know about education and the arts, but I knew about school. So I thought, okay, I'll just go to school to learn. Well, that was not how the journey went. <laughs> I didn't know that you had to know how to dance to go to school for dance, right? I didn't know that in higher education. So that began a very hard, difficult, painful, humiliating uh, journey for me. It took me about eight or nine years to get into a school for dance. So when I finally got into a BFA program, I was 27. Wasn't that much younger than my professors, as is the case now in my MFA. Um, so I left California not even being able to get into school. The Lord led me to what program to go to, because uh, I didn't know anything. Got this degree, this BFA degree with the credential didn't even know about credentials or what they were for. I came back to Los Angeles, a hot commodity, all of a sudden, because I had this credential. So there was this brand new performing arts high school that was opening up in Los Angeles that I got to uh, basically walk into. I was hired to build this program from scratch, like it was paint and air. There were no students, no curriculum, no school open yet. So I literally got to build this program from scratch um, along with my other coworkers, which was amazing. So when I was in the Hush Company, I had that, ex or should I say, when I met the Hush Company, I had that experience. And then when I started ministering with the Hush Company, I saw that what happened to me literally on that mountain was happening to other people. So I said, God, what is this? And I didn't know what to expect because I was just learning to hear from him. Um, I knew that God would speak, but I thought he would speak to me like when I was an adult, <laughs> like a bona fide adult, like in my thirties, you know, I thought that's I love it. I love it. Uh, right. And yeah. so I just, I asked, what is this? And I didn't know it was a question of destiny that I was asking. And all of a sudden I started getting these downloads and it got to such a point where I couldn't write fast enough. I had to start carrying a dictaphone. And so after a couple of years, the Lord told me to put it in a book. So that's when I wrote my first book, Dancers Assume the Position. Then when I was teaching at the school in Los Angeles, um, there came a point where I was starting to get really frustrated with my students. And I realized it wasn't them that had changed. It was me that had changed. I was at the place where I needed an outlet. It was time for me to start my career as a choreographer. So I started doing that, things were taking off, and the Lord said, now I want you to write about this experience, being my child, a dancer out in, in culture. So then I wrote the second book for that. Um, I left there in 2016 at the Lord's leading. Um, he was like, there was one day that uh, I was just watching my kids in the hall, like I would always do, and he said, four years. In four years, it'll be time to go. And I was like, okay. And four years, I left. Um, so I left there. Uh, then I um, was like, okay, this is me going into my work. So in 2015 is when some, you know, Kingdom Artist Initiative started bubbling up in me. 2016, I wrote Defying Discord. Um, so yeah. And then this angel of a lady y'all are looking at uh, invaded my email one day and was like, hey, what you doing? <laughs> and then I ended up here in Jackson, Mississippi, of all places. So, yeah. Such a great story. <laughs> I, I love it. I never, get, I never grow tired of listening to that story. Um, just God's... Um, investment and how he had already invested for so long in you and the power of the arts right just as you had that experience and so it's going to lead us into this first question but just validating 
God utilizing artists to transform and yes. to, and we know, you know, heal and bring perspective and bring truth and redemption. And there's so much that happens in the art. Yeah. But for you just to hear that, you know, go watch, go watch, go right. watch and to, and to obey. And then it was like, uh, I just, it's phenomenal. Yeah. This entire, entirely different life started from that one instruction um and i was telling a young lady i was like that voice that i listened to i just kept listening to the voice and then eventually i got to know who it was and i got to recognize it but that same voice has led me into everything um that you know my life has become has produced it's just been doing what i did that one day on that mountain so that just, I mean, that's a beautiful segue into cultivating a practice of listening and learning. Um, so you say, basically, I just do it. Um, but can you give us a little bit more like street how to? <laughs> how do you just About do it? learning to yeah, listen. Just listen. Just how do you, in, in discernment even, how do you know it's the voice of God? And yeah, yeah I just, I'd love to hear from you in that regard. Sure. So I have, I, pertaining to God first, I have a couple of things. And, you know, one of the things is we need to recognize that we are not in relationship with God. I mean, yes, he's God, but we're in relationship with him as dad, not as God, but as dad, right? And so what healthy, loving father wouldn't communicate with their children? That's first off is that we need to believe that he would communicate with us, right? Um, and so sometimes when I've talked to artists, like I was, I was teaching at a Kai workshop and I just very, you know, casually and flippantly was like, yeah, and the Lord said to me, and, and this woman, she stopped me and she goes, what do you mean God talks to you? Like she was, you know, that was a stumbling block for her. And so starting from this idea that God is our, not this idea, but this truth that God is our father and healthy fathers talk to their children. And so for us, it's either we don't recognize the way that he communicates with us, right? We don't believe that he would talk to us in an area of our life. So when we hear him, we don't recognize that that is him. And so I would pose that you are hearing him, you just maybe don't recognize it's him, you don't have confidence that it's him, right? So those are things that you need to develop confidence in. And the first way you do that is that Bible. That Bible will let you know how he talks, what his character is, what things he will say and won't say. And one of the things I say is, you know, I remember my pastor teaching this and he said, um, and from this, you know, the Lord dealt with me, but I ask, like, if there were a crowd of people and your mother was in that crowd and they're all talking, would you be able to recognize your mother's voice out of that crowd? And most of us would say yes. And the, and the way we would be able to recognize her voice, her laugh, um, the way she says things is because we've spent time with that voice. And in the same way, you need to spend time with that voice. And that means at the beginning, sometimes you're gonna have to take a risk, right? Cause you don't know yet. So you're gonna have to take a risk. And then when you take the risk and then God lets you know, yeah, that was me, that was me. Then you have, you have trust for the next time he says something in the next time. So learning to listen is kind of like building a muscle. And the other thing, I say is if I came to you and I said, your mother said something to me, right? You would be able to tell me whether or not that's something she actually said. For instance, if somebody came to me and said, my mother cursed them out, I would say you're a liar. Cause I know my mom, but she wouldn't say that. Right? So then when we're hearing things and the reason, or let me say this, the reason I know she wouldn't say that is because I know my mom, right? 
And so that's what the Bible helps us do is to get to know the character and the personality of this God, this father we're in relationship with. So if you have thoughts that come that don't seem to line up with this God you've met in the Bible, then that's one of the ways that you check as well. Um, so that is what I would say with learning to listen to God. Um, you got to believe that he actually will talk to you, that there's nothing mundane about you, right? I remember there was one time, and it only happened one time, but he taught me there's nothing about you that's insignificant to me. But I was curling my hair for something, and all of a sudden he started talking to me. Curl this one that way. Flip that one that way. And it was the most amazing hairstyle that I've never been able to duplicate. It never happened again, but it was when I was young and hearing him. And it was like him letting me know, again, there's no place that I won't talk to you about, right? Um, and so he's, he's in every part of that. And I practice his presence. I actually talk and expect to hear from him. Yeah. So wonderful. Well, I think what I'm hearing, definitely that um, taking a risk part, we have to be invested. Mm -hmm. And even that first real encounter with you coming to dance and listening, is it characteristic of God to say to do something? Yes. Is it characteristic for him to lead us in a good direction? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, was it characteristic that you personally were drawn to the arts? No. And yet you chose to listen to the voice and trust, 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 right. trust that where he was going to guide you would be for your benefit and obviously for his benefit and the kingdom's benefit. Right. Yeah. So I, I feel like that is so important. And sometimes um, I think as we are, you know, diving in and choosing yeah. to trust that there's times when we even have an expectation of what the answer is going to be even before God has an opportunity to speak. And so mm -hmm. can you even speak towards that? Just what have you found in ways to kind of set aside your own particular agenda and really trust that God is um, going to have his agenda come to right. pass as you relinquish. Right. So, you know, God gives us vision for our lives. And I, <clears throat> excuse me. And I truly believe, uh, I think about the verse that said, God gives us the desires of our heart. And that's in two ways. One, he gives our heart what to desire when we seek him and two, he fulfills the desires of our heart, the ones that are present in our heart. And so one of the things that I've come to recognize is the things that I, for which I have ambition have been planted by him. They are godly desires. And so when he's leading me, it's not him leading me away from what I want. It's leading him into or him leading me into what I want. Where, we, where I believe we get tripped up sometimes is it doesn't happen in the timing that we want. It doesn't come in the package we expected. It doesn't come through the door or the person that we anticipated. And so those are the things that can get us trapped. It doesn't come through the pathway that we thought. We thought A, B, C was going to happen, and it's X, A, Y. You know what I mean? So those kinds of things can get us tripped up. So what I have learned over the years is to t take my hands off of the how, right? I know that God is the author and the finisher of my faith. He's the author. He's the finisher. He's the one who says, I will direct your steps. So full all stop. I have to. Yes. Like full yeah. stop. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Like I will direct your steps. Yeah. I will guide you with my eye. If you commit it to me, I'll make sure your thoughts are agreeable to my will. Like these are things that God tells us in his word about how to follow him. So it gives me the ability to take my hands off of the how. Right. Even, and I mean, okay, okay. 
I'm not perfect in this. Like the other day I was telling my friend, I said, have you ever seen one of those dogs on the street, the little dogs that are on a leash and they're so ready to go that their legs are going sideways like this? <laughs> and sometimes I get like that because I've seen where, or should I say, I've seen a glimpse of what where God is taking me. And it's very easy for me to try to jump the gun. So I'm not perfect in this, but I'm always able through his guidance and counseling and chill outness to bring it back, right? And when anxiety tries to come upon me, I'm able to deal with that by knowing who I'm in relationship with. And it's not a question of if it's going to happen. That's a settled matter. And I just have to deal with my own heart and mind and spirit when I get anxious in the how, the when, the where, the who, and I just have to practice laying that at his feet. Yeah, maybe your next book should be something like, you know, if isn't a question. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Because boy, has that been the story of my life? Yes. Like I, I can see it's taken 20 years to happen but I can literally see the threading together and the constructing of what he showed me. It doesn't look like what I thought it was going to look like. I certainly got my timeline off, but, <laughs> but I'm literally watching him weave these things together. Yeah. And that's God, right? That's God yeah. ultimately who knows what is incredibly the best. Um, one thing I'm learning in life, now and I mean I've known it but I feel like I'm just really really understanding yeah God is so slow <laughs> so slow <laughs> like so slow <laughs> like painstakingly slow <laughs> and then in an instant you know things will happen just like that but right. it seems to me that the greater percentage percentage of my encounters with God it's slow. <laughs> it just takes time. It takes it does. Time. Huh? And 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 to that, it's so interesting. I, I did an episode about this on my podcast. And the what I'm learning is the reason that it takes so much time is because God is working multiple operations right? First of all, there are the things, the, the, the infrastructural things that have to come together so that what he told you he'd give you or told you he would have you do is possible. Like I remember um, my pastor, he gave, he gave this image of, he said, God has given you a vision, but your vision is for the 38th floor and we've only constructed up to the second floor. So it's not that God didn't tell you, is that we haven't gotten there yet. So sometimes the infrastructure is not built. Sometimes it's development in you. Like again, when I broke down in your car unexpectedly at the Dairy Queen on the way to the airport, the thing that I was like, I was so anxious when I first reached out to you those years ago to get ready and I wanted to come and it took us a few years. And then when I got there to do the residency at Bellhaven, I realized I wouldn't have been ready for back then. And then you blew my mind with your response when you said, Marlita, back then we wouldn't have been ready for you. Oh, so there's a whole system that needs to be put in place. And the other day, my friends and I, we were talking about Daniel's account, right? When Daniel had prayed, and the angel was coming, it took 21 days. And the powerful truth in that is, is the angel told Daniel, from the day you prayed, I was on my way. I left the day you prayed, but it took 21 days because there were other things that we don't see, right, at, at play that have to be addressed, instituted, constructed, relationships, you know, maturity. All of these things are at play, which cause the slowness. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so right. 
<laughs> and I think that we just can be narrow sometimes. And this is another thing I continue to learn as I'm in my, you know, maturation process of growing and deepening in my own faith journey. Yeah. Sometimes we get narrow to think that, right, I'm communing with you, God, this is what I'm asking of you. And, you know, that's the, that's the focus. Right. And as I've grown in my faith, obviously there's something sweet and intimate and kind and gracious of God to, to do that. Yeah. It's never that it's never that never that it always is for the greater good, for his glory, for the kingdom, from what comes here, then from me will go out there. Yeah, exactly. It's so much bigger. Thy kingdom come. It's not my yeah. personal, you know, communion with me come. Right. It's thy kingdom, thy kingdom. Your right. ways come here and your ways is where to love you and where to love and serve people. Where to serve you, God, where yeah. to give our life offering to people. And so I just believe every single act of God is absolutely that vast. And yeah. in, our, in our narrowness, we see it like that but in his operation. And what's really powerful about that, what you just said is there are always lives and other relationships and other um, encouragement to other people, not only through you directly, but by the way he brings you into what he's going to bring you into, right? So even your journey, him bringing you in, is also constructed in a way where he can bring others in as he brings you in by them observing how he brought you in. So good. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm, I'm over the perspective that I had for quite a while in my journey was, um, I don't know how you think God has any time for you all. <laughs> <'Cause> I'm, <laughs> I'm such a hot mess. He's got to be spending all his time with me. <laughs> such a narrow perspective. <laughs> That's hilarious. But just, you know, understanding now, God, she's so much bigger <laughs> than that. But I just feel like, I, I'm occupying all your time. God, I'm so sorry. I'm back at it again. And oh, forgive me again. <laughs> Teach me what you say. <laughs> and yet he's like, okay, well, I'm telling you, but I've got a billion other people that I'm just talking to at the same time. And that's reassuring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank goodness. Right. Yeah, Cause we absolutely. have those seasons. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank goodness. So we've we've been talking about just cultivating, listening and cultivating just these life skills of um, yielding. What else do you feel like are valuable qualities as a dancer or leader, people who are in, you know, this faith journey, just qualities to continue to develop um, that are valuable? So I was thinking about this, um, what, how I would answer this question, and two words came to me. The first one is humility. Um, that is something that has been um, just kind of evident in various parts of my life in different ways. As an educator, it is humility in me realizing I don't know everything, nor is it my responsibility to know everything. It's humility in my students' lives to know I am not your be all end all. I am one part of this huge, huge journey of your life, <clears throat> excuse me, that many people are going to speak into. Humility in, in the recognition that I'm not the first person to say this, nor the last. I resonate with you the way that I resonate with you because of other factors. Maybe it is my time right, to speak into your life. Maybe it's because, you know, we're both from California or whatever. There are these other factors. Um, and leadership, it's humility to know um, I'm not the smartest person in the room. I'm not the only person with an answer or who can contribute to this answer. Um, you know, there's so many ways that, that this idea of humility plays out. And, you know, we're talking about learning to listen and you can't listen if you don't have humility. If you don't recognize I'm not the only person with something to say in this conversation of something to say of value, 
right, in this conversation. Um, and if you don't come to the conversation with that, then you can't listen. You can hear, but you can't listen, right? Um, and the other thing that I think is really important is malleability. Okay, three, malleability and grit. Oh God, you have to have grit. You got to have grit, 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 because this ain't easy. <laughs> It is not easy. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, not that the, it's not that the actual things, the logistical things that you're doing are so difficult. It's the emotional difficulty that comes, the psychological difficulty that comes with waiting, with trying again after you failed, been told no. Y'all know how many times I've been told no? Nobody was interested in hearing anything I had to say for years, like over 10 years, almost 20 years, nobody was interested. I'd like to say I've always had this in me. I mean, it's, it's become sexier, more refined. I've, you know, I've got my stuff slick. It can flow out of my mouth a lot easier, but I've been carrying this for years before anybody cared that I existed or had anything to say. You know, so, so sometimes we get discouraged when things don't happen in the time that we want to, but do you continue? I mean, let's be transparent. I keep writing these books, you know, they're not flying off the shelf yet. Do you think I care? I just write the next book. <laughs> I just build the next course because <laughs> one day they're going to, yes. right? I'm seeing that, I'm seeing that trajectory start to shift. And so the Lord says, write the next book. I'm like, I, I ain't even sold that many of the one you just had me, but you just keep going, you know, that grit. And then the malleability, because you need to be able to shift. You need to be able to shift and, and you need to be humble enough to go, you know what? I thought I knew, but I didn't know. So let me, let me lower my ego and make this shift, right? Because if you don't, you're going to break. If you're not malleable, teachable, you're going to break. Yeah, that flexibility. It's right. huge. Yeah, it's really huge. And I think even what you're talking about, um, there, there can be fear as a Christian to be malleable, to have mm -hmm. that, um, just that characteristic to think, Am I going to get too open? Am I going to become too flexible? Am I going to start moving in a direction that gets me off of the path because yeah. I am, you know, being, you know, moldable and um, influenced or, you know, there's fears that rise up with yeah. that. Yeah, um, naturally. Partly because of, you know, how we've been taught and trained as of right in our families or in our churches or with doctrine or whatever that might be. Right. Um, so I, what words do you have for that? Just how people can relinquish the fear that might rise up when they're being, mm -hmm. you know, challenged by God to be a little bit more flexible and a little more open to consider things from a different vantage point. Yeah. So I would go back to what we started <clears throat> or what we talked about in the beginning of, first of all, uh, um, you guys hopefully don't see my messy house, but I need to move to a charger. <laughs> um, but the first thing is remembering who we're in relationship with. You're in relationship with your father. And so just as hopefully your natural father doesn't beat you to death when you make a mistake, or should I say, let me say it like this. The Bible says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more would I be able to, your heavenly father? So even if you don't have that um, you know, amazing father experience, um, he is a good father. And so recognizing that he is not interested in beating me over the head for every little mistake that I make is important, first of all, that he is for me and um, is for my development. And second of all, I think about the verse in the Bible that says that God will make our crooked road straight. Now you don't need to put a provision in the word 
for making crooked roads straight if your roads never get crooked. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. Um, and right. so right. Th there is no surprise to him when you and I make mistakes, go the wrong way. You just fix it. Just, oh man, I thought that was this. It was not. <laughs> Let me flip and turn the other way. And that literally is it. Just get up, fix it, and move on. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's honestly really that easy to do. Um, he's not disappointed. He doesn't go, oh, gosh, I thought she was this or he was this and they're not. I'm so disappointed. Like, that's not the way that he interacts with us. And that is so difficult for the artist. I mean, for people in general, but for the artist to receive yes. that. Yes. Right? It's antithetical to our training. Yeah, that's right. We're performers. And mm -hmm. so how do you um, get past that? Because we're pursuing not necessarily perfection, but excellence. And yes. if I miss the mark, it's like it takes a while for some to get you know, get it all pulled back up again to absolutely be able to, you know, put another foot in front and another foot. And so that, I mean, that's just like the epitome of God's character of absolutely you know, loving us unconditionally that it takes a lifetime, a lifetime to really grasp what that is. And for me, you know, I just gave this explanation that made it sound like I got this on lock and I never struggle with this and listen to anything <laughs> that we're talking about that comes out of my mouth. I say it with the acknowledgement um, and the transparency that I am human. And this is something sometimes that takes months to get over, right? Um, it is not easy. It is not easy to deal with this stuff because we are emotional, psychological beings. And God knows that in dealing with us. And I think the only thing that I would say is, are you willing to let him into your imperfection? Because sometimes we want to get it together first before we go to God because we want to yeah. show him yeah. Yeah. we're more mature than, they, than we are. Yeah. And my thing is just like, God, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem saying, you know, I don't have anything to say to you right now because I'm heartbroken. Like that, I asked you for this, I did not get it, and I feel like you broke my heart. I'm angry with you. It's okay to say that. Yeah. I still talk to him, but yeah. I tell him, I'm angry with you. I don't understand why you let this happen. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so I never stop talking to him. I never, I never hide my feelings from him. It's like David. David was all, all <laughs> he was all over the place, but he never hid that from God, right? And he never shut <laughs> God out of that that journey, that yeah. very tumultuous emotional journey. And even when there were things that he didn't agree with, things that he didn't understand, it never broke the relationship. Yeah. And, and I think that has bared out in my life that no matter how I felt, no matter heart, how heartbroken, no matter how hard it was to go to him because yeah. I didn't want to, because I felt so angry, heartbroken, let down. I might take a few days to do it, but at the end of the day, I'm always going to go back. Yeah. He gave me this. It was so funny because he, this just came to my mind. So every summer I go to Spain with this project called the Edge Project. And there was this one particular summer that happened and something happened. I don't even remember what happened at this point, but I was just so... I just didn't have anything to say to God. I just, I was like, I, I just, I, I don't understand. I don't understand how this keeps happening, why this has taken so long. And he, he answered me with an exercise. So we were doing Psalms. And so he gave me this exercise and it was a three part exercise. And so I got a chance to lead the group through it. And so the first part of the exercise is this is what I'm going through, right? This is how I feel. This is what I'm going through. This is what I'm whatever. So we wrote that out in 10 minutes, just 
let it go. And then the next part of the exercise was, but you said. So then we had to write out everything that God said to us, what scripture said, what God has shown us, that kind of, we did that for 10 minutes. And then the third part was, so I will. And so we wrote that. And then he told me to lead us where we read off of our paper while the other person prayed for us. So with my partner, again, he's leading me to do this while I'm like, I don't even have anything to say to you, but he still spoke to me and I may be angry, but I'm not a fool. <laughs> when he speaks, I answer, right? Yes, yes. So, so I, so I led this workshop. So it was time for my partner and I to do it. She read hers. I was praying. Cynthia, I read mine. I got to the so I will. I couldn't even get the words out. Like in that moment, he broke in a good way, broke my hard, the hardness of my heart, should I say, in that and healed, right, through me going through this process. Lord, this is how I feel. This is what I'm struggling with. But you said such and such and such, so I'm going to. And at the end of the day, that is the repetitive walk that we have to do is yes, we have a right to our feelings. He acknowledges our feelings. He gives us room for our feelings, but that doesn't change what he said at the end of the day. So the question is, what are you going to do about it? Right? Yeah. Are, are, you, are you going to continue? I was thinking also about the children of Israel when he was leading them into the river and you've got or, or he wasn't leading them into the river, but he was leading them out. And they get to a point where it's, it's the sea in front of them and, and the Egyptians behind them. And they're like, Lord, you led us here. And he goes, keep going. I, I mean, what do you think? there's nothing but the water in front of them. And he's like, what are you looking at me for? Keep going. <laughs> so we get to this place where we, we get into these perplexing situations. And he's like, I haven't changed what I said. The question is, what are you going to do regardless of what you see around you or what yeah. you feel? Yeah. Cause I haven't changed. So yeah. what you going to do? Yeah. And that's, those are the places where we have to wrestle with our humanity and how we feel. And sometimes it takes us a little longer to get to the place where we're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Wow. And in talking about humanity and talking about um, just navigating in our own faith journey, yeah. how are you seeing God move in this place of humanity in the world today? How are you seeing God move in the, um, in the arts and mm. what value the arts have or just, um, just either you can even be in the marketplace or just, right. years, just what do you see in God do? today in the arts so it's really beautiful um you know the arts have always been something that has been that have been very powerful so you're seeing arts being used to heal you're seeing arts being used to provide catharsis to create community to give voice <clears throat> to bring healing um, as it was for me i remember when I was dancing in the Hush Company, I was up there supposing with, I was there to minister to other people. But sometimes I was up there getting delivery for myself. You know what I mean? And so there was this nice reciprocity, this circle of how God ministered to and healed all of us, us included, the ones who were supposed to be up there leading worship. Yeah. Um, so I've seen it there. Um, you know, provide resource and income, um, just so many ways that I've seen God using this vehicle that we have, um, a way to provide lens and perspective and yeah, just a lot of really beautiful ways um, that I've seen him, restoration, just, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Lastly, just in closing, 
just if there is anything that you that we haven't touched on that you'd like to share and, mm. and obviously I know we're in this whole season now over these last months just people might watch this and you know years in advance you know years from now um, yeah we're in the midst of pandemic you know when we're in the midst of a lot of upheaval and social injustice and just a lot of attention in some really needed areas to focus yeah. and to you know reset recharge um realign repurpose i mean just so much that um revalue um, right so just in closing i don't know if there's anything related to any of those areas or just in general to the artists that you'd like to share or speak so to just know you have such a wealth of wisdom and a beautiful perspective one of the things that that the Lord has been dealing with me with for a while um, and has been stirring in my heart, I know particularly from my life and then thinking about artists in general, is from Second Kings 4.4, when the widow woman found the prophet Elijah and, you know, she explained to him, uh, you know, my, my husband is dead, I have all these debts. And he asked her, what do you have in your house? And so she said, you know, I got some oil and, you know, she told him what she had in his house. And then he told her what to do with that, right? And so that has been a powerful framework for me that the Lord taught me I was using, you know, when it comes to our provision, what do you have in your house? I say to you, artists, what do you have in your house? These gifts, these abilities, these thoughts, these concepts, ideas, that the Lord has given you, right? Um, and she had them in her house, but one, she didn't know how to value them. One, she didn't know, let me say before that, she didn't know they were anything of value and she didn't know what to do with them to produce value for herself. She didn't connect oil to being able to meet her needs, right? So the spirit of God gave her strategy, direction, instruction, of how to take this stuff that was in her house and transform it into something that would meet her needs. And so I want to say to you artists, you have valuable oil in, your, in this house that God has given you, um, not only to serve society, not only to build his kingdom, but to provide for your life, to serve your life. And so I encourage you to go to the Lord and ask, what do I do? with this that is in my house, right? How do I train? He told her, put it in vessels and take it to market. Lord, what vessels should I put this oil in and take it to market? Because he said, put the, go borrow vessels from your neighbors, fill the vessels with oil, take the vessels filled with oil to the market. And when you take it there, sell it and you'll be able to pay off your debts and live on. And man, if I don't live off that principle, Lord, show me what vessels to put this stuff in. Show me what marketplace to take it to. Show me how to sell it, right? Because you said this will provide for my life. And so that's what I would encourage you to do. You know, we sometimes as artists, we're like, well, I do this for the love. You better do it for the money too, because you know what? <laughs> <laughs> because, because you need to live and you can't love you know you can't love in the way that God would desire you to love beyond yourself if you yourself are so consumed with how you're going to survive so there is wisdom in that you can do it for the love but also do it for the money and this is for especially for artists who are more in the ministry side to the local church and specifically to the church, even us, right? It takes money in this world that we live in to make things happen. So it's, it's okay to ask God for financial strategies, right? It's not being selfish. That's wisdom. Sure. So sure. those would be my parting words. Yeah, that's good. So good. Um, this morning, I actually listened to um, a sermon, and that was a part of the excerpt was from the same passage. 
Yeah. And the focus there was, you know, reiterating what you're saying, but also this concept of um, being told, you take the empty vessels. They have to be emptied. That means mm-hmm. you're coming from a place where you really don't have anything in the context. Right. Of, yeah, you've got the canister, you are the vessel, yeah. but it's in that place of really articulating to God that um, th- this is my weakness, this is my insufficiency, this is my inadequacy. That's right. where God gets to be strong. That's where God right. gets to say, okay, that's your perspective, but really this is what you're made of. And so yeah. what you're made of is this because I'm going to be a coherent team with you in your creative endeavors or in your execution as an artist or in your output or in your productivity or just all of that. Um, So just really, I love that this is what you're articulating this morning and um, today and, and hearing that and me hearing that earlier this morning, it's like, yeah, there's Mm. something really significant in that. And it gives God then a fuller, um, permission to do the miraculous, to, right. to be able to um, articulate what it is that he wants to through your artistic endeavor. It's, yeah, it's such a, such a beautiful word. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, him lifting the curtain on one of his strategies about how he does things in your life. It's one of the ways, you know, that he brings things to pass, that he provides for you, that he So, you know, I I think of it as one of the ways we get to see his divine, a part of his divine operation at work, you know. And we know enough that we don't want him to reveal them all. Right. At once. Right. (laughs) Because if he does, we would get back to saying, okay, be slow. (laughs) Slow down. (laughs) Because it's too much, and we know yes. that he doesn't. He, you know, doesn't give us more than we can handle. To God be the glory, because you know, you know what we can handle, what we can't, and right. In His love, His kindness, He is just so good, so gracious. Yeah, my friend, this has been a beautiful um, I know. time to communicate and visit and share and hear and listen. And so, just thank you for your continued investment in the world. Thank you for holding on to the artistry that God has placed in your DNA. Thank you for being an example of sitting at the feet of Abba Father and allowing him to continue to love you and to be a conduit for that love and for that understanding to fellow artists around the world and others that you encounter. It's just such a blessing and um, I'm thankful that his timing has been his timing yes, in same your here. life. And um, there's just so much more yet to come. There is so much more yet to come. And so I bless you with that and knowing that um, this good work he has begun in you, he is going to keep on keeping on in and through you. Thank you. And Thank I'm you. thankful to be your sister and to be able to journey with you in, in these days and the days to come. So thank you. I love you. I love you too so very much. Well, we'll make sure people have access to connect with you. So when I put this link in, just again, you can articulate it again about Kai, anything that you want to say, and we'll make sure we get access to you as well. Perfect. So just in short, um, the best way to connect with me is either through my website at MarlitaHill.com or on Instagram at I am Marlita Hill. Beautiful. All right. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Blessings, everyone. Thank you.